Well, I met Gordon in uh, 1983, 1984, when his first book, Somebody's Husband, Somebody's Son, about the Yorkshire Ripper, was published. I've worked at Faber for 20 years, since I was 21. And um, I was lucky enough to work with people like Ted Hughes and um, Seamus Heaney. And I would put Gordon in that company. Yeah, I mean, he's sort of up there, you know. I mean, he's, he's one of the most brilliant people I've known. He had a very strong sense of who he was and where he came from. And also he was very funny and nice to be with. Good company. Such an intelligent person. When you got to know him, he was incredibly funny and just very bright and fantastic to talk to. Well, as a writer, I think it's very interesting because it's unusual for uh, any writer to have a career uh, as glittering on the non-fiction side as it is on the fiction side. I mean, many novelists write books of non-fiction. Gordon sort of divided his writing between the two and did them both really, really well. I loved Alma Corgan. And really, that was his first novel, and all of the themes and subjects that he was interested in, in and off the page, were kind of encapsulated within that book. He had a great book about the snooker boom in Britain in the 80s, Barry Hearn, and called Pocket Money. That's where Gordon's work was so great. It could, um, it could pinpoint these moments and very sort of prophetically um, see how these cultural or sporting moments said something about British culture and politics. And I, I love his last novel as well because it was so ludicrously ambitious. It's just a kind of a, a magnificent, unusual, unorthodox attempt at reinventing what the novel does and how the novel records who we are. There isn't a week goes by when I don't look at something in the news or in culture and think, what would Gordon have made of that? He would have, he would have known what to say about that. Shortly after his parents both died, we found this house and um, it was the perfect place to work in. Basically, when he realized he wasn't gonna be able to use it that much. He wanted it to be kept and he wanted people to be able to go and work there, which is what he'd wanted to do there and he, he thought it was a great place to work in. Well, we wanted to do something that would really continue Gordon's legacy. The Gordon Byrne Prize represents quite a lot of things. It sets out to find people who reflect his sensibility, which as I say is an unusual sensibility because it comes from the North, it comes from the working class. It takes in non-fiction, fiction, crime, true crime, reportage, sports writing, writing about art. There are no boundaries to the prize. The only boundaries are, does this loosely fit the Gordon Byrne sensibility? There's the literary prize, and there's also now an art prize. So those two people can use the, the cottage if they want to for up to three months. It's got the feeling that he wanted to have, and, and also it reminded him of his childhood. When he was there, he used to get up at six in the morning, light a big fire, and make a pot of tea, and do all those things. So he tried to keep it very basic. I say to people, well, what, what are you missing? The only thing anyone's so far asked for is a toaster, which I have refused. <laughs> but I'm thinking of that. People are going so far, they don't seem to be the usual suspects. That's something that I think he would have been very happy about. And I'm quite happy about that too. <laughs> well, hopefully the books on this year's shortlist represent who he is to some degree. That's the point of the prize, that it is a reflection of his personality and of, and of his interests. I think, you know, he was, you know, he would really, another phrase that he would really, really hate is a Renaissance man. But in so many ways, he was, let's say he was a Renaissance Geordie.